Nuclear power plants represent one of humanity's greatest engineering achievements. These facilities harness the heat emitted by the breakdown of radioactive fuel to provide affordable electricity to about 10% of the world's population. However, the cooling systems responsible for regulating this heat are not perfect. These systems can fail and give rise to a chain reaction in which the nuclear fuel melts and destroys its containment, releasing deadly radioactive particles that will spread far and wide. This event is known as a meltdown, and it is one of the most terrifying man-made disasters that the world has ever seen. Radiation generated by these events can spread rapidly over thousands of miles, leaving extensive damage and death in its wake. Even short-term exposure to radiation can make entire cities uninhabitable and poison farmland for thousands of years. Furthermore, meltdowns pose a serious threat to human health. Although their immediate impacts are often invisible and might not manifest for decades or even generations, we possess first-hand knowledge of the threats posed by nuclear meltdowns because they have happened before. A meltdown that occurred in 1986 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in present-day Ukraine has been linked to thousands of deaths, and victims of this disaster are still being diagnosed with cancer today due to the widespread radiation. More recently, extensive damage sustained during a tsunami in 2011 caused a meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan. Radiation from this event could be detected as far away as Germany, and it has already been linked to a handful of cancer diagnoses. Chernobyl and Fukushima are just two examples taken from 20 partial or total meltdown events that have taken place since the 1950s. And with over 400 nuclear power plants currently in operation throughout the world, it is likely that more meltdowns will occur in the future. Today, we're going to attempt to speculate where the world's next nuclear crisis will happen. We're going to investigate three possible examples of meltdown causes and the locations where they are most likely to occur. We'll then examine what, if anything, can be done to counter these risks and reduce the likelihood of another devastating meltdown that will haunt generations to come. Today's video is brought to you by the wonderful folks over at Squarespace. Now, if you haven't heard of Squarespace, it's the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy for you to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place, all on your terms. So imagine this, you've got an amazing idea, but you have no idea where to start with building a website. Well, that's where Squarespace Blueprint comes in. This guided design system lets you choose from professionally curated layouts and styling options so you can build a unique online presence tailored to your brand or business. Plus, it's optimized for every device. You'll be discovered faster thanks to their integration integrated, optimized SEO tools. Plus, with Squarespace's Fluid Engine, you could unlock unbreakable creativity. The next-gen website editor makes customizing your site a breeze with reimagined drag-and-drop technology. Whether on desktop or mobile, you can stretch your imagination and design exactly what you envision. Plus, flexible payment options from credit cards to Apple Pay and PayPal. And you can offer customers buy now, pay later with Afterpay and Clearpay in eligible countries. So, go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. That's squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects for 10% off. Big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring, and now back to today's episode. Let's begin our analysis with a story of corruption and mismanagement that was discovered a year after the Fukushima meltdown just across the Tsushima Strait in South Korea. Due to its lack of fossil fuel resources, South Korea began aggressively establishing nuclear power facilities in the 1950s. By the early 2000s, South Korea's 23 reactors fulfilled about one-third of the nation's energy needs. However, cracks in South Korea's nuclear power industry started to become evident in 2012. This is when a cooling system failure, lasting nearly 12 minutes at South Korea's Korea's Cori-1 nuclear reactor plant resulted in a rapid and dangerous temperature spike. Managers at the plant attempted to conceal this event by destroying records, even though they were obligated to report it to the Nuclear Safety and Security Commission. Despite the attempted cover-up, the event was eventually reported a month later. The resulting investigation found that the incident was caused by a failure of operators to follow multiple safety procedures. South Korea's nuclear power industry would sustain another blow shortly after this event when a dangerous system of bribery, collusion, and corruption, referred to as the nuclear mafia, was identified by a whistleblower. An investigation determined that in the past decade, over 10,000 safety tests had been falsified for components installed in over half of South Korea's nuclear reactors. Companies responsible for these tests see the purpose fully skipped examinations or outright fabricated test data to fraudulently approve reactor components. 
The consequences of this corrupt system became evident in 2013, when communication cables produced by a company called JS Cables caused two reactors to unnecessarily shut down. It was later revealed that of the 12 samples sent by JS Cables for certification, only three had passed safety tests. Investigations later determined that the three passing samples had failed to undergo required radiation exposure prior to testing. These cables had already been installed in four reactors and were slated to be installed in multiple other reactors that were under construction. In response to this corruption, nearly 8,000 components installed in South Korea's nuclear reactors had to be replaced. Estimations suggest that this replacement effort cost South Korea's nuclear power plants over $8.4 billion. Analyses of South Korea's nuclear power industry identified a highly centralized system in which two state-owned entities were completely responsible for operating power plants and procuring reactor components. Additionally, investigations identified a personnel pipeline where managers are retiring from these state-owned entities or would be hired at companies that tested and supplied reactor components. These employees were then susceptible to manipulation and bribery from their former employers. Eventually, 68 of these individuals were convicted and sentenced to serve a cumulative 253 years in prison. The fallout of South Korea's corrupt and negligent approach to nuclear energy is also not contained within its own borders. South Korea has expressed a desire to provide nuclear reactor construction and operating services to other countries since the early 2000s. Their first contract was awarded to the United Arab Emirates in 2009 to build and help operate Abu Dhabi's Barakar nuclear power plant. South Korea took aggressive measures to secure this contract from the UAE. Engineers removed important safety features from reactor designs to offer a more affordable price. The South Korean government even signed a secret defense agreement with the UAE to sweeten the deal. This agreement obligated the South Korean military to intervene in an Emirati conflict. The Barakar plant was under construction when news of South Korea's nuclear corruption broke. Investigators determined that faulty parts had been used in the construction of the Barakar plant, which delayed its opening by about three years. South Korea's government has taken steps towards building safeguards to protect against corruption since the discovery of its nuclear mafia, but it's difficult to say how much the South Korean nuclear power industry has recovered since the scandals of the 2010s. The system is highly centralized and susceptible to the same pressures that affected it previously. It also appears that safety issues are still prevalent. As recently as 2019, operators continued to keep a reactor active for 12 hours after the core began to rapidly overheat. Simultaneously, South Korea is still attempting to secure contracts to build reactors abroad. In 2022, South Korea was awarded a contract to build four nuclear power facilities in Egypt. They are also currently attempting to finalize deals to build plants in Wales, Poland, and the Czech Republic. While we have focused on the case of corruption and negligence in South Korea, it is worth noting that these issues are not completely unique to this country. Indeed, significant corruption has been uncovered in the nuclear power programs of over 15 countries. We only know as much as we do about the corruption in South Korea because a whistleblower chose to reveal it. Activities that are just as bad or even worse could be taking place right under our noses. And we might not know about them until it's too late. In the next chapter of our analysis, we're going to examine the nuclear power facilities in India. Specifically, we're going to focus on India's coastal regions, where nearly two-thirds of their nuclear power facilities are located. It's worth stating that this trend's not uncommon. Countries often build nuclear power plants on coasts, where the massive volume of water required to cool the reactors can be easily sourced from the sea. However, what is uncommon is a country like India, with multiple coastal plants that are also flanked by active underwater earthquake zones. To India's northwest, the Makran subduction zone in the Arabian Sea has been responsible for earthquakes that caused multiple tsunamis. In 1945, a magnitude 8.1 earthquake produced a tsunami that damaged some of the very regions of northwest India where nuclear power plants are located today. To India's east, the Sumatran subduction zone in the Indian Ocean also possesses a record of producing violent tsunamis. In 2004, this region was the site of the most powerful earthquake that has been seen on Earth since 1964. This quake produced a tsunami that battered India's east coast and even flooded a nuclear power plant there. Fortunately, this facility then automatically shut down, preventing disaster. We might assume that this type of sobering experience would be enough to encourage India to reconsider its placement of nuclear facilities, but we'd be wrong in doing so. Since the 2004 tsunami, one additional nuclear power plant has opened on India's east coast, with construction planned to begin on another facility in 2025. 
Although safety features were successful in preventing disaster in 2004, it is useful to compare this event to the 2011 Fukushima tsunami. The Fukushima facility possessed the same safety features as the plants located on the coasts of India. Due to these features, only one of Fukushima's four reactors experienced meltdown. But even though the safety features worked in 75% of Fukushima's reactors, we saw how devastating a single reactor meltdown was. Perhaps it would be worth considering just building these facilities on higher ground. In our final example, we're going to return to Ukraine, where Chernobyl showed the world just how devastating a nuclear meltdown could be nearly 40 years ago. Today, we're going to discuss the Zaporozhizhia nuclear power plant. This plant is Europe's largest, containing six reactors and producing up to 20% of Ukraine's electricity. In recent years, it also tends to be surrounded by conflict. The Zaporozhizhia power plant began to capture the world's attention when conflict erupted in eastern Ukraine between pro-Russian separatists and Ukrainian armed forces in 2014. Battles took place as close as 200 kilometers from the plant before drifting further away. This made observers a bit nervous, but this would not compare to the anxiety they'd feel several years later. Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, with a particular focus on Ukraine's easternmost regions. The world watched with fear as Russian forces crept towards Zaporozhizhia a blast, and then finally to the power plant. By March, a full-fledged battle was taking place at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Any damage sustained by the cooling systems or reactors could quickly give rise to the world's next nuclear meltdown. Russia captured the power plants by mid-March, but this was far from the end of the saga. Russia initially refused to cooperate with the International Atomic Energy Agency's efforts to assess damage at the plant, leaving the world wondering how dire the situation truly was. The agency's investigation finally took place in September, and its findings offered a sobering look at how close Europe had come to a nuclear disaster. The plant had sustained considerable damage during the battles. A high-caliber round had penetrated the outer wall of a reactor, and an artillery shell had struck dangerously close to another. A new concern emerged in June of 2023, when the Kakhova Dam was breached. This dam formed the reservoir that provided water to cool the power plant's reactors. Fortunately, the situation was not as dire as it could have been because five of the six reactors had been shut down and no longer required intensive cooling. The International Atomic Energy Agency responded by installing 11 new underground wells to provide enough water to cool the last operational reactor. The Zaporozhizhia power plant continues to be engaged with the ongoing war in Ukraine. The area is plagued by active conflict, including a drone attack that damaged multiple reactor containments in April of 2024. Some reports also suggest that Russia is storing heavy weapons on the grounds of the facility, although Russia disputes this claim. The American Nuclear Society has said in a press release that, given its current dormant state, the Zaporozhizhia power plant is not likely to be responsible for a major radiological disaster. They stated that even if a reactor was breached and radioactive material was exposed, only the immediate vicinity of the plant would be threatened. While the Zaporozhizhia power plant itself may not pose an immediate threat of nuclear meltdown, it is worth thinking about this in a broader context. A war is currently taking place in Europe, where 40% of the world's nuclear reactors are located. An escalation of hostilities could easily threaten other nuclear facilities and give rise to a new crisis. Humanity is forced to contend with few existential threats more concerning than nuclear radiation, and the event most likely to bring people face to face with this deadly force is a meltdown. Here, we've attempted to predict where the next nuclear meltdown is most likely to occur. And now, we'll slightly change the question from asking where will the next nuclear meltdown happen to what can be done to prevent another one from occurring. Our analysis gives us some very tangible starting points. In the case of corruption and negligence, these problems should be addressed primarily on a policy level. Nations should seek to diversify the entities responsible for overseeing nuclear power operations and component sourcing, avoiding an overly centralized system like the one seen in South Korea. Countries should also implement laws that reflect the gravity of nuclear power mismanagement. These laws should come with harsh punishments for attempting to exploit these systems for personal gain. Following the discovery of South Korea's nuclear mafia, the government pledged to ban corrupt suppliers from government contracts for 10 years. In reality, the ban only lasted six months. If we truly wish to prevent mismanagement of nuclear facilities, these crimes must be taken more seriously. 
The solution to nuclear meltdowns caused by natural disasters is very straightforward. Don't build nuclear facilities in locations prone to catastrophic events like tsunamis or volcanic eruptions. These are two of the most destructive natural disasters, and they pose a serious threat to any nuclear power plant in existence. Fortunately, it's quite easy to predict where these events are going to occur, with tsunamis occurring on coastlines near active earthquake zones and volcanic eruptions occurring near volcanoes. Simply choosing to build nuclear power facilities elsewhere could prevent the world's next nuclear disaster. The most difficult nuclear meltdown threat to navigate is war. While regulations have already been enshrined in international law to prevent attacks on nuclear facilities, controlling aggressors is often difficult in practice. However, even though the situation in Zaporozhizhia made onlookers nervous, the events that unfolded do offer some room for optimism. Despite being caught within a vicious struggle between two nations, these parties eventually cooperated to allow the plant to be inspected. This kind of cooperation and respect for intergovernmental agencies will play a crucial role in avoiding nuclear crisis during future conflicts. History would suggest that since nuclear meltdowns have happened before, they will happen again. But this statement doesn't necessarily have to be true. Indeed, if we learn from history, perhaps we can significantly reduce or even eliminate the likelihood of another meltdown taking place. We've examined three locations that could be the site of the next nuclear meltdown for three distinct reasons. However, through careful application of policy, diplomacy, foresight, and maybe a little bit of luck, perhaps the answer to the question, where will the next nuclear meltdown happen? happen could be nowhere.